We're going to talk about the pure in heart today. Um, and unfortunately, I'm really only going to get to scratch the surface of this, but uh, I hope it'll be meaningful. Um, We've been in a series on the Beatitudes, and I just keep saying this because I, I just want every person to have it drilled into their head that uh, the Beatitudes are not really a list of to-dos, but it's really Jesus' vision for what his disciples would look like. It's the type of character, the type of nature, the, the, the motivations, the, uh, the orientations of their heart that would be... Um, would all be you know, sort of in the image of uh, what he paints in the Beatitudes. And the first, uh, the first few, he's talking about the internal world. Uh, and then he transitions uh, with the internal, from the internal world with righteousness to also the external world. And righteousness um, is something that we receive, but it's also something that we put on display. Uh, it's uh, the, the robes of righteousness. Our lifestyle is a, uh, Paul would say this, we are the uh, visible display of the infinite riches of God. This is in Ephesians chapter 3. And that's what we are. So righteousness is that. So Jesus does this internal thing and this external thing. And then um, the last uh, four Beatitudes all have to do with the, the outworking of, of what God is doing in, our, in, in our, our hearts. And it brings us to the pure in heart, which... You might actually think, well, isn't that an internal thing? Um, yes, it is, but it also includes uh, an external thing. It actually is, uh, in the Hebrew mindset, to be pure in heart uh, was, uh, well, they looked at the heart as this, this package. I mean, take a take a three braided, you know, rope, right? Or a three strand rope, you know, you get that image in your head. And to the heart in the Hebrew mindset was essentially the, the rope itself. And it consisted of these, these three strands that are all braided together throughout um, the, the biblical narrative. And what happens is, you know, when you put all these things together, it looks like uh, there's a, a piece that's uh, our motivation. There's a piece that's our feelings or our, our, our thoughts. Um, and there's a, a piece that is actually the, our will, our deeds, the things that we actually put our hands to. And that's what uh, the heart and the, the Hebrew mindset would have 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 thought of that all of these three things. And so there is a, you know, a certain, to a certain degree, it's true that the heart is the, the totality of the internal world, but it is, it is more than that. It's the manifestation of the internal world. You understand? So it's, it's, um, Jesus is basically, you know, drawing this conclusion that, you know, you know, colloquial, uh, you are what are you, what is it? Uh, sorry, lost my train of thought. Um, what you see is what you get. We know that. That is to 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 actually live that out is what it means to be pure in heart in the biblical sense. And that's what Jesus is kind of driving at. But he's also um, doing something really unique with Psalm 24. And it's that he abbreviates the, the whole passage. And uh, Psalm 24 is, this may sound familiar. It'll be on the screen behind me. It says this, verse one. It says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the, from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek his face of the God of Jacob. Selah. Does that sound familiar? Where did you just hear that? Was somebody paying attention? Oh, there's a song, right? Yeah, we got the song. Okay. Um, 
Jesus is taking this passage, it's half the psalm. The other half of this psalm is just a, is a, is actually a, just praise, just giving praise, David giving praise to God. But he takes this, Jesus takes the first six verses and basically just abbreviates them. It says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Right, so the, the beatitude has two components, right? There is the purity of heart, but then there's also the, the seeing of God. And these two things stick together like, you know, two pieces of Velcro. They, they, are, they are attached. That um, those who want to see God must in order first to be pure in heart, right? And so Jesus is giving us two pictures of, uh, in this beatitude of incredible significance, incredible magnitude. And it's, again, this is like, these, are, these are two monolithic uh, ideas that really, in order to get, we can only, today, we can only scratch the surface of, but um, they are massive. They are massive. And the, the purity of heart, the first one, heart is the interior life. And that makes up the feelings and the motivations, the thoughts, basically our mind and our will. And, and the Pharisees of Jesus' day, this is like kind of sometimes, you know, throughout the, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, you have to, you have to understand Jesus is kind of like poking um, the, the religious mindset of the day. And this is one of those places that he does this. He just jabs at, at this, this idea. And the, the idea was in the Pharisees that the purity of heart you could not have because uh, you can't wash the heart, right? Like, can you wash the heart? No. So the, the, the Pharisees were basically uh, saying, in order, to, in order to, to have purity of heart, what you have to do is you have to make sure that your hands are clean. And so they developed all of these, you know, systems of, you know, uh, what they call ritual purity to go through this cleansing process so that um, anything they touched or anything they consumed was 100% clean. And that actually they thought that um, it was sort of backwards that uh, through the, the cleanliness of their hands and the things that they consumed with their clean hands, that that would achieve purity of heart and so what they did is they had it they had it backwards where Jesus actually you know debunks this and he turns that whole idea on his head and its head in Matthew 15 um, when it says the the disciples came to him and said uh, hey the Pharisees are offended uh, that we uh, as your disciples we actually don't wash our hands before we eat what it says they're offended at that and their mothers would be too. Uh, they didn't have hand sanitizer in the first century. Um, and Jesus, he turns the whole thing on his head. He says, look, a person is not defiled um, by what they put inside of themselves. A person is, you know, like you eat and the food passes through. You discard it, is what he says. Um, a person is clean or proven to be clean by what flows from their heart. For out of, and this is what he says in Matthew 15, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands doesn't defile the person. So Jesus is, you know, he's in the Beatitudes and here in Matthew 15, he's, he's, he's poking at this, this idea that um, we consume food with our clean hands and we consume water with our clean hands and it somehow changes the nature of our heart. And that is the opposite way of looking at it. That's, that's completely backwards to what you actually do. Because you can't, you can't wash the heart. And Jesus is saying, look, if you ate something clean, 
It's not gonna go to your heart, it's gonna go to your stomach. Get it? Yeah. So the pure in heart, what they do is they, they're, they're people who demonstrate their alignment with, with God's kingdom through their thoughts, their love for others, and their acts of service. It's, it's the whole internal world manifesting through our lives. And what, what it means to have purity of heart and be someone who is, impure, who is pure in heart means that there is no, there is no uh, difference between your internal world and the external world. What, what people see is truly what they get from your lives. It's the result of everything that's happening on the inside. Do you know someone like that? Let me ask you this. you know someone who uh, it seems like everything they do has a, has a motivation for some other like purpose? Yeah, you know that person? That, that's not the pure in heart. The second thing that we have in this beatitude is, you know, and it's this very significant idea, and that is seeing God. It is really sort of cause and effect. The pure in heart see God. But seeing God is, wow, this is, I could spend weeks talking about this, starting with the, you know, the Garden of Eden. Um, throughout the Bible, understand like Eden happens right and we all we know what happens in Eden that you know God created and then dwelled man dwelled with man um, it says that God walked in the garden in the, the cool of the day uh, then man fell and and man hid from God and because of their sin they were they were exiled and throughout the whole biblical narrative what you see over and over and over and over again is this um, this it's like this drive. It's very subtle at times, but it's this drive for humanity to get back into Eden. And so and this, this takes shape you know, through um, uh, temple activity. And so in Genesis, you know, they get exiled, and the next page, what happens? You see Cain and Abel. What are they doing? They're bringing an offering to God. Uh, that is... That is a, an attempt to get back into the presence of God. That's, that's temple activity. And then the, you know, the flood happens, and what's the first thing that Noah does? He, he builds an altar, and he makes a sacrifice to the Lord. That is temple activity. It's, again, now on the other side of the flood. We're trying to get back into this, this Eden type of uh, ecosystem. And then, you know, the story goes on. There's a tabernacle, and the tabernacle is sort of a, a mini Eden, and then there's a temple, and the temple is sort of a mini Eden. And, and I just draw that whole thing out for hours. But um, this is one of the recurring themes throughout the Bible is that we want to get back to Eden. We want to get back into this place where we, as, as humanity, have eyes to see God. And, and throughout the Bible, there's this, this underlying tension of uh, you want to see God, but you can't see God. The reason, and Isaiah picks this up, the reason you can't see God is, uh, this is Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. It says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins, get this, your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. There's this, this tension of wanting to see God, but you can't see God because of, of this separation that you have. Even, even Moses, who was considered a friend of God, he said, Lord, Lord, I want to see, see your face. I want to see your glory. Show me, show me who you are. And Moses, you know, was, a, again, a friend of God. God spoke to him clearly, not in riddles and, and rhymes, but face to face, it says. Mouth to mouth, he spoke to Moses. But when it comes to showing Moses God's form, Moses, or God takes Moses and he places him in a cleft of a rock 
and then passes by and says, you can't see my face, but you can see my backside. There's this desire to see God all throughout the Old Testament. And God's form, let's call it a form, is the other part of the, you know, uh, three-stranded rope that Jesus is, is showing us here. The, the three strands of, of this rope are uh, his presence, or his, his face, his arm, as we saw there, you see the face in Isaiah 50, 55. Um, you see the, 59, sorry. Uh, you, you see the, the face of the Lord. You see the arm of the Lord. And then you also, there's another aspect of this. This is glory. You see the glory of God show up. And so those three concepts are wrapped up. When Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for you shall see God, those are the three different aspects of, of God that you see. And if you're wondering, well, what does this, this look like? Well, take the, the passage out of Isaiah that I just referenced and put it up against some passages in uh, the Gospels and the book of Acts. And the, the Gospel of Luke, it, in describing John the Baptist, it says that the hand of the Lord was upon him. And then you look at his ministry and many people were coming and repenting and being baptized. Uh, of the church in Acts, it says in uh, chapter four, I think verse 30, that um, the disciples were gathered in the room and they were praying. They said, Lord, give us great boldness. Uh, and uh, one of the things they specifically said, stretch out your hand, Lord, upon us and perform signs and wonders among us and that many would believe in the name of Jesus. All right, so there it's a, you know, the hand of the Lord is a euphemism in, in Judaism that actually represents God's power, his, his anointing, his authority, uh, and uh, to bring about his mission or his, his uh, mean or his will upon the earth. Um, in Acts chapter 11 of the church of Antioch, it says that... Uh, uh, there among the, the church at Antioch, who was the, the Gentile church, uh, they had believed uh, the gospel and they were beginning to preach the gospel. And it says that the hand of the Lord was upon them and many, many had turned to Jesus. It says this again in um, I think Acts 13 in several different places. One place it actually in Acts, it talks about like the hand of the Lord is a, is a, is a hand of judgment that comes upon a person um, and it does the, the supernatural, is his power. So these are the three different you know, aspects of, of seeking his face. Those are the things that, that as we have purity of heart that we actually begin to see. Are you with me? Yeah? So the significance of having a purity of heart, a purity of our, of our mind, of our will, of our motivations, of the, the, the workings of our hands, the, the purity in that means that like the church in Acts, we, we see God move in our midst. There's, there's great significance in that. We... If you look at the times throughout the Old Testament where uh, Israel was, was sort of um, seeking the face of God or seeking the presence of God or um, the presence of God shows up in different ways through his glory, through his fire, through cloud, through, um, you know, the, the angel of the Lord as uh, Moses said, Lord, unless you go with us, we're not going. And um, he shows up. Right? He says, okay, well, I will go with you. I, my very presence will go with you. Um, the significance in all of those, those episodes is that uh, Israel gets access to God's directive presence. That he, he actually, he, he speaks to his people 
as on a friendship level, you know, plane. Like there's a like friend to friend, not, you know, God to lowly servant, but friend to friend. There is a, um, there is an access that people get to God's wisdom and his divine direction. And so we get that. And the purity of heart has access to, to that, that divine directive presence. But it also is, you know, as we see in the book of Acts, it's, it's, a, it's an empowerment for kingdom mission. That we as, as God's people and our purity of heart, we, we receive the power from on high to go and be witnesses in Judea, Jerusalem, or Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utter ends of the earth. There is, a, there is an empowerment to go and do the will of God in this earth and to see his kingdom come in ways that surprise us and are quite simply awesome. The third thing that it means, you know, to actually seek his face is to uh, to be set apart for his presence. Israel is a, is a holy nation. This was God's word to them. You are a holy nation. And, and Peter echoes this, this idea in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we now as a church, as God's people, we are a holy nation. We're a royal priesthood. And we, our job here on this earth is to go about and, and bring the will of God to earth and release it in the earth so that lives are transformed and people are touched. The purity of heart that sees God, it really is a cause and effect. You can't wash your heart, right? But God can, can't he? That's the, that's the, the beauty, the, the new covenant that we, we just remembered today. That's the beauty of the new covenant is that, that the Lord, through this, this work of the cross, changes our heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh. That we are, we are washed and we are cleansed from the inside. That we receive a new heart. As Paul says, it's the circumcision of the heart. The time's almost up. I feel like, you know, when uh, you're in school and the, the teacher says, when I flash the lights, it's over, right? Yeah, you're like, okay, it's over. So how, how, does, how does this washing of the heart happen? It's a decision that we make is what it is. How do, like, how do I get, how to become a person of the purity of heart that, that Jesus says that they, they're the ones that are, see God, that are going to see God? How do I do that? You open your heart and say, Lord, wash me. Cleanse me. Remove within me those things that are not of you, those things that are of the world. It's a, it's, a ref, it's a refinement is what it is. Malachi, Malachi says, says this in Malachi chapter three. Um, and this is what I, that's really what I think. Like Jesus sort of is sort of in a, a roundabout way pointing to. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he, that's verse two, for he is like this, a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he will sit, this is, this is interesting, get this. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi, and he will refine them like gold and silver. And this is what they will do after they receive the refinement. They will bring in offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Go back to the righteous, right? Blessed are the righteous who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be satisfied. 
Righteousness is internal. It's something we receive, but it's also something that we do. Malachi here is saying, God is, God is a refiner of our hearts and lives so that we will bring an offering of righteousness to the Lord and he will be glorified through our works, through our lives. He receives the glory. But where does that start? It starts with, Lord, refine me. Alex, you back there? He's waiting for me. I'm gonna close today. As you stand. We're gonna close today with a song and some of you will recognize this song. Some of you, I'm sorry, um, you're just too young. <laughs> you weren't a twinkle in your parents' eye when uh, the song was written. But the song, the song itself is a, it's a prayer. It's a, it's a cry to the Lord to be set apart for his working, for his will, for his ministry, and for his, his mission. It is a, it is a, it's an invitation for us to ask God to come and consecrate my life in such a way that, that I am among the pure in heart. That me, you, all of us, we, we receive the cleanness from God. And as a result, we get to see God move in our lives and in our world. Let's sing.